Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the virtual North Shore Garden Tour. I'm Lynn Brockington, Community Experience Coordinator at West Vancouver Memorial Library. Tonight, as part of our fall garden series, four local gardeners are going to share with us their beautiful gardens. Our first garden, created by Laura Marie, is an example of urban permaculture in West Vancouver. Laura has her certificate in permaculture design and has studied its subsets of regenerative agriculture, rewilding, silvopasture, forest farming, and mushroom farming. Laura's lifelong passions of culinary anthropology and growing and preserving food inspired her to interpret and reimagine permaculture principles for urban environments in an effort to become more resilient and self-sufficient herself and to inspire as many people as possible to grow, eat, and preserve sustainably. So Laura's going to come on now. She's going to join us. And if you, um, hi, Laura. Hi. hi. Thank you. And uh, welcome to my urban permaculture garden. Um, permaculture is a kind of complicated idea, but I've simplified it uh, for, for myself and for you into a design system for sustainable living and land use that adheres to natural logic. Um, it was, it applies primarily to rural environments and um, it is centered on three governing ethics, which are earth care, people care and fair share. So if we look after the earth and people and share what we have, um, that will help us um, move through the 12, the 12 um, principles, which you can learn more about if you wish, they're listed here for future reference, but they start with observation and move through, um, I can't see because my picture is over top of this, conservation, um, integration and observation and oh, adaptation, that's it. Okay, uh, urban permaculture, this I can talk about forever. Um, I believe it is a way forward for all of us. It's for the masses, for people who live in cities, and the millions, hundreds of millions of people who live in urban environments. It offers something for everyone and it embraces the ethos and ethics of permaculture. And my favorite part is it is as much about art and intuition as it is about science and stricture. And my favorite um, advice that I give people is not to worry about following the rules, to just imagine and implement as many permaculture principles as you can, um, and you are permitted to, uh, to live beautifully, righteously, and sustainably. And this is why. So here on the right, this is our, our uh, home site. It is a drone shot taken in August of our home, um, as it is now, it was built 72 years ago. Um, up until six months ago, our front yard was just a big grass field and we did all of our living in the back on that left pointy end. Uh, we grew vegetables and fruit. We lived there. We had a, a, a naturalized garden. Um, very beautiful. On the left, you'll see uh, the permaculture, the rural permaculture zone ideals. And this would be any property, a big property, rural property, whose owner would have lived there and observed it for a year or more, um, cited their homestead, and then built their installations out in concentric circles based on, on um, hydrology, wind, water, weather systems, uh, animal pasturing, and different things. Um, and had we purchased our property as an empty lot, we would have done the same thing, starting in the middle and working out. But because we moved into our, our house, I guess 21 years ago, 20 years ago, um, it came with all sorts of foibles and we had, um, yeah, what do you call those things? Um, we had um, utilities, hardscaping, roads, neighbors, all kinds of rules and bylaws. Of course, it doesn't work out that way and it never does in urban environments. It actually worked out like this, which is fine and normal and typical of an urban environment. And that leads me to the, my next point, which is just do your best. 
If you're into permaculture and what it stands for, then you just learn and follow the principles. You garden, garden organically, you design intuitively, you create and respect habitat, and you waste nothing. So, and this is gonna be a shocker based on the photo you saw, this was our front yard in March. A big, flat, empty space that um, was full of possibilities. When we moved into the property, uh, we were surrounded by trees. We had a beautiful microclimate, lots of privacy, um, and things changed in the last six years where we lost a lot of the trees. We got a lot of wind, a lot of runoff, water runoff. But nonetheless, we had this beautiful blank slate, a healthy soil. We, the leaf letter was always left, leaf letter. And so, sorry, it fed the soil biology. We had good drainage. We had beautiful 72-year-old uh, hedge outside the fence. We had nice boxwoods. And behind us, we had some mature conifers, maple, and a beautiful wisteria standard and some paving, a small greenhouse and in-ground irrigation. So a nice blank canvas. We had some ideas. COVID hit and we went into lockdown and we also got very busy. And five months later, this is what we had. A really beautiful lush urban, urban permaculture, almost farm. Um, we had no dig raised beds, nine of them. We had a mini fruit orchard, fruit and nut orchard. We had a food forest running the perimeter of our property under a trellis. We'd started converting the lawn into um, a pollinator, like a pollinator turf kind of a thing. We'd built privacy and wind barriers. We had in-ground worm composting. We'd rewilded to some extent. And we had some water management, some permaculture, permaculture water management tools in place. We were planning for tw uh, 12 month food production. And we had uh, already, we had cited, tested and cited some spots for mushroom, uh, mushroom garden, a uh, sod covered root cellar and a keyhole garden. So we'll just go through a couple more views here. You can see it's quite pretty all in five months, believe it or not. That's permaculture for you. So starting with the beds. So we have, uh, the beds are four by eight by 20 inches or two by eight by 20. They were lasagna layered. So I used um, composted sod on the bottom. I uh, dug up 500 square feet of sod last year and I left them to compost. So I laid cardboard over that and put organic uh, compost on top treated the wood organically. It's no dig, so there are no weeds. Uh, the soil is very healthy. It's full of organic nutrients, lots of microbes, and a very healthy mycorrhizal fungi uh, network, which you'll see a little bit later. And the beds are oriented west to east, and that's just what I thought intuitively would work, and it actually does. Um, so you can see in the top left, there's a couple of beds just getting top dressed with some more compost. Uh, the soil is very healthy. The mushrooms kind of are an indicator of that. Um, we have a raised bed on the bottom middle picture there. That's an old iron bed that's got about, it gets about four hours of sun a day. So it's really good for greens. Uh, they don't get burned, they don't bolt. And the smaller beds we use for tomatoes and potatoes. And in the back, this, the picture in the middle is a, is a raised bed, one of several we have around the back. And that's how I garden for years. They're, they're aluminum feed troughs, animal feed troughs, and they're on casters and I can move them in and out of the sun, in and out of the rain, works really well. Um, worm composting is kind of fundamental to the uh, urban permaculture garden. You can see a black uh, in the foreground on the bottom right, there's a black, about 24 inches deep worm compost. It is black plastic, quarter inch holes drilled all around. We compost our kitchen waste in there, uh, eggshells, coffee grounds. We supplement with brown paper or leaves, a little bit of hardwood ash. And uh, we populated it with um, some neighbors red wiggler worms. And soon enough, there were just, there's like, I don't know how many, I'd say millions, it seems like millions. There are a lot and uh, they go in and out of there, they eat. They come back into the dirt and poop, which is great. And uh, we keep, the, the trick is of course, is to keep it well watered, keep the ants out. 
um, produce the compost tea and keep it lidded and submerged below the soil level other than the lid just to keep the bears away. You, you can see the little guys there on the left. Um, the composts are a really great way of keeping the garden clean and just making life easy. When I'm cleaning the beds, I just toss the yucky bits into the worm compost. And when I'm cleaning the root veg, I do it there in a bucket. I pour everything then back into the compost. So you have a compost tea going into a worm compost tea and everybody's happy. Um, an herb spiral. This is a very popular permaculture installation. It is uh, typically situated within 10 feet of a kitchen door. Mine is 75 feet from the front door. Not ideal, but that's what worked. And that's where the sun was. Um, it's based on a natural shape found in nature, which is the Fibonacci or a snail shell, a, not, a nautilus shell. Um, it is meant to create multiple microclimates um, over, a, over the in various uh, elevations, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so there are many different drainage, soil, sunlight, shade, companion planting situations over the course of this, of this installation. And it runs the whole gamut of um, like a Mediterranean dry climate in the top south to a bog or wetland environment on the bottom north. So there's actually a little watercress pond bottom north which spills into a bog of Labrador tea. And these things are very difficult to grow under the best circumstances, but this little baby just looks after itself. It, uh, I don't water it, although it gets watered with the lawn and rain, and it just percolates down and does what it needs to do naturally. Our mini fruit orchard. Um, we have 18 fruit trees, fruit and nut trees, on dwarf stock. There's apples, um, pears, plums, cherries, and an almond, and a crab apple for cross-pollination. They're planted in guilds of three, so that, uh, and they're planted in guilds of three with lots of air space in a column up the center of the trees. And that column is important that it's kept clean with no cross branches so that air and light can get in and the trees stay disease free. They're pruned uh, to seven feet. I'll never let them get beyond seven feet because I can reach seven feet. I can see aphids, I can clean them, I can prune them, I can harvest, I can do what I need to do. Um, there are, they're underplanted uh, with guilds of, of um, plants that attract uh, beneficial insects and pollinators. They mulch and keep the soil cool. Uh, they're also very pretty and I haven't had any problems really. Well, a few aphids, but um, we look after those with ladybugs. So here you can see the planting in the spring just when we we're putting in the berry patch. Um, and on the right you can see a columnar, that is a golden something or other apple. Um, but it's amazing how on in just three feet you can get so many apples and it'll just get more prolific as time goes by. That's just a new tree. On the bottom center there you can see an espelier apple in a container uh, in the backyard and that's how we used to garden. And that is my bait tree. So I let the squirrels and raccoons go to town on that tree and they feel like they're getting something over on me and uh, I'm happy they do because they leave the fruit out front alone. We have a persimmon, a potted persimmon here on the left. Um, I put it in a pot en route to wherever it was going but then it set fruit, a ton of fruit, um, most, most of which actually fell off to the ground as the tree was self-regulating and deciding for itself how many persimmon it could support. And that so it looks like we'll have 12 persimmon in December, which I'm excited about. The uh, top right photo there is of a plum, which has five varieties grafted onto it. And that was really exciting because we had, we had um, yellow egg, we had damson, green gauge, quite a few actually, it was, pretty fun. And the bottom bottom middle photo 
you can see that there is a, an almond, very a healthy almond tree in the middle. And the plums are on the left and the far right, there are three columnar cherries. And we didn't get any cherries. We had lots, but the birds ate them. And we have a small berry patch. Um, this wasn't meant to be a permanent place for the berries. It was just meant to be a nursery bed trans trans transition. Um, three different kinds of gooseberries, currants, blueberries, and they are planted strategically downhill so that the blueberries on the bottom, which like the most acid, get the most acid. And the, um, um, what do you call these guys? The um, gooseberries at the top get the least. And like uh, with the apples, I forgot to mention, all of the fruit, we pick them just before they're ripe so that we don't get any bears, raccoons. They seem to know exactly when things are ripe and come in and wreak havoc, but we, get, we pick before and we haven't had any problems at all. Quite a few, it was actually very prolific. There were buckets of fruit from those tiny wee little plants. Now bees, um, we have a lot of, we, have, we love bees. We love native bees and non-native bees. These are native bees. They, um, they don't live very long. They live four to six weeks. They live in this, in this habitat, um, ideally under the eaves of a house with morning sun, with the access to water. You see the little water feeders with pebbles. Bees drown easily, so they need feeders like that. They need access to dirt to seal the eggs in those little tubes that you saw earlier. And they need early blooming um, um, food source. So Heather, the cornelian cherry, cornelian cherries bloom in February. It's a native plant that a lot of people, not that many people know about. And then the rest of the, the native bees and non-native bees love the lavender. We planted um, 120 Heather Alba plants along the lower perimeter of the fence and under the arbor. They bloom October through May, so they're great for bees. They're also extraordinarily good for bee gut health. Um, they keep bees healthy and be, there's been such a lack of diversity in bee habitat that uh, populations are falling, but this is, this is a good thing anybody can do for bees is plant uh, Heather Alba. Um, we've got honeysuckle all over. We've got about hundred feet of it running the eaves of the house, plus a little archway in the back. And then also when my vegetables go to seed or if I need, if sometimes I just like them to go to seed, but I will cut, I'll cut the stalks and put the, the flowers in a bucket and they'll stay there two or three weeks and the bees are happy and I get to move on with my planting. Speaking of bees, we are replacing our lawn with a pollinator turf. It requires much less water. It needs very little mowing attracts pollinators, it's uh, weed resistant, chafer beetles hate it, and I like it because you don't have to worry about edging because it's kind of messy around the edges, but it's also very pretty, frilly and flowery, and um, it's really lovely. I tested it in areas you can see on the left, the lower area there, that is chafer beetle territory. I planted the top part with the turf. It takes a very long time to germinate, but once it does, it's really resilient and tough, and you can see the difference there very clearly. It's very pretty. And ground covers. I am very happy, uh, or very, excuse me, lucky, I suppose, because I love moss. I love moss. I love all kinds of tiny green wild things, and I hate weeding, so, um, I am all about letting the moss grow everywhere and all the uh, ferns, the wild violet, the uh, bearberry, the um, bleeding heart, the more the merrier. It's not for everyone, I realize that, but uh, I think it's quite beautiful. And we've been rewilding. So we are slowly trying to rid ourselves of plants that just take a lot of care, take resources, a lot of maintenance and give nothing back except maybe one or two days of a pretty flower. And we're replacing them with wild, um, wild species that are righteous, give us something back, require low input and uh, maybe provide me medicine or a food source for wild creatures. There's a list there that you can refer to later, but um, where do, you can see this here and there throughout the yard in the top left we've got some goat's beard um, 
and goat's beard is beautiful uh, in the shade. It has, throws a really beautiful bright white, you can see on the bottom, flower that really lights up the darker areas of your garden. Uh, top middle is a native honeysuckle. It loves deep shade, which is unusual for a honeysuckle. And it, uh, and the um, hummingbirds love it. And the maidenhair fern pops up all over the place. The plant on the middle bottom that looks like a maple is a high bush cranberry. And that is underplanted with evergreen huckleberry. And, I'm, and then there's sword fern. So it looks quite beautiful, I think, and it is native. And on the right, we have fun uh, carose, which is popping up all over the place. We manage pests uh, naturally, as naturally as we can. Ladybugs, they're in a little ladybug habitat. They eat aphids under our fruit trees. Um, we gild plants, we use row cover, we use bait plants. We keep the beds as clean as we can so that slugs aren't attracted. We just use the worm compost. See ladybugs there happily munching away the aphids on the chamomile that has underplanted the fruit guilds, fruit tree guilds. And the nasturtium was bait for, for the um, aphids as well. Um, they never went to the nasturtiums, but uh, they all, we also didn't get a, an infestation of aphids this year, which was great. And the lavender, I dry, I pick some of the lavender. We have a big lavender berm. And, um, and I leave it in the tomato beds between the tomato and the basil and it keeps the insects away. It looks really pretty. Um, have never had any issues with tomatoes in 10 years. And then the copper mesh you see there in the green in the bed, the spinach with the spinach. Um, I'm not sure what happens with the slugs. They, something happens when the slime meets the copper and it must hurt because the slugs don't bother my greens at all. Um, mushrooms. We have identified, I'll just go ahead here, an area at the back of the garden on the north end. You see the, the log there on the left. And I, an area where we can, um, let me see, go back here. I put a big leaf maple log in that, slice of log in that spot over the winter to see what would happen. And it uh, grew some turkey tail mushrooms, which told me that that was a great spot to start um, mushroom gardening. So shiitake logs, lion's mane there in the middle. Um, lots of deep, hum uh, beautiful woody ground, uh, not very much wind, a little bit of morning sun. So we'll experiment, experiment with that next year. I put a couple of photos of some uh, indoor mushroom farming that my daughter and I did. Um, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we inoculated some pasteurized and inoculated some straw with some um, green uh, spawn, oyster mushrooms. We did pretty well with that. Uh, stored heat, this is a great permaculture uh, tool to use thermal mass to store energy, solar energy during the day to release it at night slowly and to reflect the heat off vertical surfaces that store heat also like homes. This little covered uh, outdoor area in the back, we have uh, 18 trellis tomatoes here. And those tomatoes throw fruit right through November, well, well past first frost. It's open, it's open on two sides. It's an L shape, it's covered with an open glass cover. And you can see in the bottom middle there that the plant is long past, long past dead and the fruit is still ripening. It's a great trick, not unlike the lavender against the thermal mass of the brick or in a concrete planter. So finally, that went by quickly. Um, I just wanna bring the, the chat back around to habitat and to permaculture and uh, permaculture as a a uh, way to live your life, to manage your life, manage your land, and just follow nature's logic, and to think about um, our planet as a sentient being that knows what it's doing and will keep us all safe and regulated and support life if we kind of leave it alone, which we haven't done. We've actually caused quite a lot of damage and um, but we can fix it, all of us millions of people living in cities. 
And that's where urban permaculture comes in. If we create a tiny habitat, just a tiny habitat on our windowsill or our balcony or front yard, we can um, make a big dent in the universe and, uh, and live forever. <laughs> that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. I honestly can't believe this garden of yours is in West Vancouver. It, it looks like it's in, um, I don't know, like Langley or like, it looks like you have acres and acres. Of yeah, land. And <laughs> it, it, <laughs> crazy. I know it's surprising. Permaculture is crazy. It's like magical. If you just get it right. Yeah. Yeah. You've done so much. And I mean, I know you probably do have a fairly it's large just, lot, but it's, you've done so much. It's fabulous. So, um, Laura, there are some questions, and I'll, I'll just start in the chat. Um, so, Midge is asking, how does no dig translate to no weeds? Okay, well, um, I started with organic compost. So, it's well composted. The weed seeds are dead. So, weeds only happen when you disturb the soil. And they don't happen, if you don't disturb the soil, you will not get weeds. I mean, the odd, you know, sunflower seed is planted by a, blue, a stellar jay or something, and I'll pick that out. But there are no weeds, I kid you not. If you plant in organic compost and you only compost from the top, you leave the roots of the plants in instead of pulling the plant out um, and just top dress with compost, there will be no weeds, I promise. Wow, wonderful, wow. Okay, um, Judith is asking what the plant was that blooms all winter, um, Heather Alba? Heather Alba, it's actually a heath, I think. There's heaths and heathers. Yeah, Heather Alba, it's white. Okay, and, and where, so what, where did you have that planted, was that? Think back. Where was it back. planted? It was planted. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all over. I've got them around the perimeters of the bed, but also around the perimeter of the fence. Oh, okay. So okay. Um, they're very bright white, so it helps light up the darker, the shadier areas. But uh, yeah. And what was the, you had a what was the hedge tree that you had growing? What was what what was that? Was it a you? That you had. A, a, your, your head. Laurel. There's what? Laurel. Uh, there's oh, a Laurel. 10 foot, 10 feet deep, 10 foot deep Laurel hedge that's been here since I think the house was built. Wow. It's, and, and the fence is on the inside of that and the trellis is attached to it. Oh, okay. 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 Um, Jillian is asking, what plants do you use under fruit trees? I use uh, borage or borage and chamomile and and chives. You can use uh, mint is a good one, fennel is a good one, uh, but I use those three because I just like the architecture of how they spill from the center right. out. Right, and, and the, the, per, the plants that you put under those fruit trees is, is to track insects, right? That would- Yes, yes, and to mulch the soil. Mm, right, right. And pollinators, attract pollinators. Yeah, okay. Um, Another question um, from Judith is, what does it mean to guild plant? Guild, like a group, a grouping. Uh, In permaculture, we talk about guilds. Sorry, that's my dog and my son. <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. Um, yeah, you, you plant in guilds, and that's one of the principles is to integrate, not segregate. And you, things want to be together, they, they feed each other and they help each other just like people do. So we plant in guilds always. Okay, okay. Um, so please tell us more about the ladybugs. How do you encourage them to live in your garden? Do you introduce them as eggs? No, I actually, I got them I, online. You can attract ladybugs. If you have a real strong mm -hmm. biodiversity, you will attract ladybugs. But because I started so quickly, I, um, what I did was I, I did two things. I bought a ladybug habitat, which is a little ladybug house, which I put on the fence by the, by the fruit trees. But then I did some research on ladybug habitat and I just built one in the ground under the, between the companion plants under the trees. And the ladybugs, when they arrived in the little bags in the mail, I put them into the habitat and they just loved it. They just stayed there. 
and they are still using it. They're still using it. They're, I don't know. Wow. I think it, I'm not smart or great or brilliant. I honestly, I just looked up ladybug habitat and built one. Okay, good. Um, and finally, um, oh, no, two more. Okay, Eve is asking, why don't you put coffee grounds in your worm compost? Why? Uh, is uh, acid. It's a, a little bit of everything. It's like putting carbon, brown paper or leaves in, uh, brown leaves for brown, green, acid, ash. I also put wood ash from the hardwood burnt in the fireplace. Um, but you can't put too much because you don't want it to become oh. too acid. Oh, Just okay. a little bit. So you'd put some coffee grounds in, right? I but put not, some in. Not a yeah. daily dose. <laughs> you know, no, I don't. Like I, I have the green, the bucket under the sink. And um, I probably put 25% of the coffee grounds into it. I don't know if that's the right ratio, but it works for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, something I was wondering about with your composters, because they were sunk into the ground, right? So yes. how do you, um, how do you get the compost out? It, you know what? It just keeps going down. It oh, just so you down. Okay. Okay. I get it. So it's, it's, there's, there's no bottom to the, to the. There, there is a bottom, but the worms, they just eat it and it turns into soil and it goes out the sides and out the holes in the bottom uh -huh. into the garden. So, I mean, it could be full and then I'll come back and it's gone down and I'll fill it up and it goes down. It's like a, Perfect little system. Wow, that's great. That's good. So, because of course I have the standing one, right? So it's got the little drawer at the bottom, and you oh, right, open right. that up and pull out yeah, your compost. I, and I am not that clever to get that ratio right. I've never figured that out actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you I were saying right. the reason you sunk them is because of bears. Yes, that yeah, we have bears. You know, up where we are, we have bear issues, and the last thing I want to do is get a bear killed because I invited him into my yard. Yeah, yeah. Have you had any bears in your yard yet? Not because of any permaculture thing or, or fruit or vegetable problem. Okay. I mean, bears are always around here and they do yeah. come in. I mean, we're gated, um, but they'll come over the eight foot fence and snoop around and, uh, but they don't go after any, anything I've grown. Wow, wow. Well, you were saying, yeah, you pick the berries before they're really yeah. ripe and yeah, that seems really yeah. smart. Okay, um, now why can't you put onion or garlic in the compost? So that may... Well, apparently worm, the, everything I've read and what I've been told is that um, compost worms do not like allium, they don't like at all. But I do have, having said that, I have a worm compost in a bed that, had, that was planted with leeks mm -hmm. and those worms were really damn happy. Like, so I don't know the logic. Maybe leeks are sweeter than most onions and garlic. Actually, there was garlic in that bed too, but it didn't bother the worms. But that's okay. the rule anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to do one more question for okay. you before we get um, to our next uh, presenter. And so um, this one is about raised beds. What would you recommend filling new raised beds with? Um, many topsoil sold at garden centers. Uh, seem to be a mix of sand and compost, missing silt, clay. Um, you know what? I, I, I would look for a municipal source of organic compost. There, I, I would. I would do the lasagna layering too. I'd put some sod at the bottom or any kind of green scrap, a layer of... Um, I just there? stopped your share. It's oh. me. Someone okay. asked. I think they couldn't see us very well. So Okay. So yeah, a layer, a layer of cardboard. And then I would... I would ask for organic compost to be delivered, or you can, you know, you pick it up, and or veggie mix. There's something called veggie mix that you can get through. I know you can get it in Vancouver. I'm not sure about the North Shore, but it's similar, and uh, that's what I would use. I would, I definitely would, as opposed to, um, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the packaged products, but I'm sure there's somebody out there that is. It's just not me. Yeah. Yeah, and it's because it's probably at this point you're not buying soil anymore, right? You've, you've no, created, you although you know it, it will it will sink some more because they're new beds. I will probably be buying another dump truck load in the spring. Okay, okay, okay. Well, gosh, that was so 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 interesting. Um, there are a few more things in the 
Um, oh, in the chat, excellent presentation, great inspiration. That's nice to hear. That's lovely. Um, but uh, we can uh, we can have a few more questions at the very end. So thank you, thank you so much, Laura. Um, thank you. Really, as one of our um, attendees said, inspiring, and that's that's for sure. It was really wonderful to hear about oh, your garden. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Good. So um, I'm going to um, now introduce our next speaker, which is Nora Gambioli. Um, and Nora, I'm sure many of you know because she is uh, a municipal councillor. She's been a councillor since 2011. And uh, Nora is a fourth generation West Vancouverite. Um, and she got me a horseshoe bay where her Italian father has a very large fruit and vegetable garden. And I, I know this because I live next door to it. Um, it was absolutely fabulous, very productive. And now Nora has her own garden where she feeds birds and bees and, and her family and educates the local community. So I'll, I'll just ask Nora to join us now. Hello, Nora. Hi. <laughs> Good. Hello there. Hello. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, is that working for everybody? For most people? Nora, it looks great. Looks okay. wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the invitation, Lynn. Um, and uh, I clearly need to take a permaculture course. That's going to be my next career. Um, I don't have quite as many gorgeous uh, photos uh, as um, as Laura, but uh, I will do my best. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, the front of our place. Um, we bought our property four years ago. And so we are still in the planning stages of the garden. Uh, the house is built in 1938 and has had several owners. And um, so the garden is not super well planned and it's a bit all over the place. But what we are trying to do is um, similar to Laura, try to plant as many native plants as we can and to help the, uh, the birds and the bees and grow food for ourselves and benefit the um, neighborhood and the community and help to educate people a little bit if possible. So I'll start with the birds uh, and I have a, a picture here. Here's a picture at the back of our property. If you look way up at the top, you can see there is a nest and that is a um, woodpecker nest. And uh, we've had that woodpecker nest for 10 years. We brought it from our other property and various and sundry squirrels have been nesting in it. But this past year, we finally had flickers and they finally had um, uh, babies. And so that was very heartening. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to give 10 points to whoever can guess or who knows what these long, tall plants are. Um, on either side in the foreground of the, um, the uh, woodpecker nest. I won't tell you right now, but uh, we'll see if anybody uh, can guess what those are. So we, uh, we help out um, other birds. We've had several chickadee families in a couple of different chickadee nests. And of course, uh, as with Laura, we're trying to uh, always help the hummingbirds. We're pretty sure we have at least one or two pairs um, uh, nesting next door in Hay Park. Uh, and, and so the hummingbirds are around all year. So we've got wild fuchsia around. And of course, we've also got uh, honeysuckle and a plant that I recently, uh, Laura would know this, I suppose, or other uh, experienced gardeners would know this, but I just recently learned that this, what I call the snow, uh, snowball bush, um, uh, has little tiny, tiny pink flowers in the spring and through the summer, and it is absolutely adored by hummingbirds. And of course, it's a native plant, um, and it is adored by all types of um, bees, native bees and um, honeybees as well. So um, I love this plant and I highly recommend this one. Uh, so speaking of bees, um, of course we have uh, the requisite plants that will uh, make uh, 
honeybees happy. We've tried uh, honeybees on three different years now, but we've never managed to make them live, allow them to help them live through the winter. So um, we keep trying, but uh, we also have the, uh, the usual other bee attractants. I love echinacea. Of course, we've got different kinds of lavender and cat mint and uh, salvia around. And uh, similar to Laura, um, one of our favorites is the evergreen huckleberry. Um, this in the spring provides great uh, little flowers for the native bees, the honey bees, and uh, bumblebees, and of course provides uh, food for birds and uh, squirrels at the moment, and us um, if we care to pick them. So uh, this evergreen huckleberry, I, uh, I love this plant. And here's a new one that uh, landed in our garden a couple years ago. I did not plant this. And from the research that I've done, some of you might know better than me, but the research that we've done indicates that it's a plant called hyssop. And it seems to look a little bit like uh, catmint or um, uh, lavender, but it's taller and all of the native bees, especially bumblebees, absolutely are crazy for this plant. And it flowers with these purple flowers from probably the middle of May until the end of August. It's absolutely fantastic. In fact, we cut some of the branches off and put them in a vase on our picnic table and the bees came and um, uh, enjoyed it uh, as the uh, centerpiece of our table on many occasions uh, and they would join us for our meals. So that's, um, that's fun. And of course, as Laura pointed out, the, um, the humble mason bee, um, this is one of our mason bee hives with the tubes um, at the end of the summer. In fact, I just finished cleaning all the tubes uh, last night. Um, but the mason bees, of course, pollinate our um, apple trees. We have three different apple trees. Um, I'm not as fancy as Laura, so I got the apple trees before they invented the columnar apple trees. So <laughs> anyway, but the mason bees, of course, help with the apples. They help with the plum tree that we have, um, the cherries, and they helped with this one, which some of you may recognize as a peach tree. Unfortunately, um, some local rodents got a hold of all of the young peaches and we didn't get to eat any peaches, uh, but the mason bees also helped to pollinate the neighboring uh, nectarine tree. And for some, some reason, the rodents didn't see the nectarines so we were really lucky in getting probably about 40 nectarines off one large branch of uh, this particular tree uh, this summer. So I was pretty happy with the nectarines. So other food that we like to grow for ourselves, I'm a big fan of rhubarb because of course it takes up a lot of space. It makes you look like a really expert gardener without having to do much. Um, because of my Italian heritage, of course, I have to grow grapes and figs as well. Um, these grapes, uh, of course, were ravaged by the local raccoons. And so what we do is we put uh, small uh, brown paper lunch bags on top of um, the uh, groups of grapes and tie them uh, at the top. And once the um, birds uh, and uh, raccoons can't see the grapes, they usually leave them alone and then they can ripen on their own inside the bags because the grapes don't actually need the sun to ripen. They just need the sun on their leaves. So um, we were able to salvage a lot of grapes this year with that methodology. 
And of course, we have the requisite tomatoes and other uh, traditional uh, vegetables that my family likes to enjoy, peas, cucumbers, beans, uh, asparagus, herbs, etc. But not in quite such an organized fashion as Laura's garden. Um, other food sources I have found out recently that this plant, little ground cover, the uh, humble wintergreen is actually a very delicious berry. Uh, it tastes a little like spearmint. Um, it's a lovely berry and uh, perhaps a lot of you already know this, but uh, I didn't know it was edible until recently. Uh, and a new uh, plant, I don't know, I hate, I hesitate to call it an edible because I'm not quite sure yet how edible it is, but I will uh, chalk this up to my husband's idea. So um, yes, we did have one uh, cannabis plant in the backyard uh, this year for the first time. Um, so moving on, this is the front of our property. Now, this is the boulevard. So the last part of what I'm going to show you is, is the public part of our property. This is the, the sort of community part of my presentation. So this was our front yard, uh, the uh, east, no, sorry, west side of our front yard um, 18 months ago, ravaged by a chafer beetle. So we took, um, chunks, uh, one foot chunks of uh, turf out and flipped it upside down and um, took out the chafer beetles and threw the chafer beetles on the road for the crows and proceeded from west to east along this boulevard for about a total of about two months. My husband and I did it all together and this is looking west at that section of the yard 18 months ago. And now that same section of the yard looking east um, looks like, or looked like this about uh, six weeks ago. So uh, we were pleased with, uh, with that improvement and hopefully the uh, birds and bees were pleased as well. Um, and on the east side of the front boulevard, here's a picture of my husband. Uh, uh, we're working, as I said, west to east. So we're getting close to finishing all of the turf there in that picture. But by now, we have really befriended the crows. And every day, we would come out for an hour or two. And as soon as we arrived, a family of three crows would descend with us expecting their chafer beetle food uh, and after we had finished the entire process of course they would come back every time we then came out to do any kind of planting or watering and they would scream at us because we were no longer feeding them but uh, anyway so now we we have uh, definitely crow friends uh, at the front of the property so now um, the front boulevard looks like this on the east side. I just took this picture two days ago. So some things have already grown and died off for the season. But anyway, this is what it looks like at the beginning of October. So we've got some uh, out on the boulevard there. We've got some Brussels sprouts. We've got some leeks. We've got some uh, red currants. We've got quite uh, a few blueberries. And we have one of my new favorite plants in the whole wide world to eat, uh, yellow raspberries. So these are ever bearing raspberries. They're still growing. I just had some today and they are amazing. And I would argue they actually taste better than regular red raspberries. So when the yellow and the blue uh, blueberries are um, growing 
together, this is what we get, bowls and bowls of yellow raspberries and blueberries. So my kids are happy. Also on the boulevard, we planted a few pumpkin plants. They didn't grow super well this year, but that pumpkin there in August turned into this pumpkin there. I took that picture this morning. So uh, that's uh, the, um, the kids uh, who walk by are often interested in what's growing in the garden. So I thought I would grow some pumpkins this year for them. We also have uh, a couple of artichoke plants that we tried for the first time this year, and they are just stunning. And of course, um, the bees really love those as well. I'm very fond of little wild strawberries. And I planted those along the boulevard, but very few people seem to know what they are or that they're edible, or perhaps people were too shy to take any. So I actually had to stick uh, little signs in the ground uh, that you can see say strawberries to eat. And so now the kids walk by and uh, some adults too, of course, and they pick the strawberries. Um, and in amongst them, we finally realized we have a, uh, an albino wild strawberry plant that only produces white wild strawberries. We finally realized they were never getting ripe and then my kids tried them and they said, oh, they taste really good, mommy. So I researched it and apparently you can have albino strawberries. So we have an albino strawberry plant that, that just created itself, uh, which is kind of fun. And the other thing I like to do for the rest of the community is when I buy new plants and plant them, I keep the tag with the plant for six months or a year so that people walking by who are interested in gardening can see uh, what it is and how it grows and when it blooms. And uh, so people seem to be quite thankful, uh, those who are interested. And uh, then I can remember what I planted as well. <laughs> And finally, I like to entertain the community when I can. So we have a little painted bunny and the kids walk by and pat the bunny. And we created uh, an Inukshuk that you can see in the bottom right here this summer from stones that we brought from Shushwap Lake. And finally, we we want to attract, uh, you know, wildlife. And last Sunday, I was having breakfast, and we did have a visitor. But fortunately, we had uh, picked all the apples off the tree, the main tree, and uh, our friend here didn't actually notice the one remaining apple tree that was in the far corner that uh, has apples that are not ripe yet. So um, he didn't, he or she didn't notice those ones. Anyways, but um, didn't really mean to attract this type of wildlife, but it does happen very rarely. In fact, it's the first time in four years that we've actually seen a bear. <laughs> anyway, so that wraps up um, everything I was going to say and show you. And Getting back to that slide from the beginning, I don't know That's right. <laughs> what that long and tall plant is. Yeah, let, I'm going to look in the chat and see if anyone has uh, dared to answer. And don't think so, but there is a question in the chat. Shall we? Uh, oh, someone says sunchoke. Oh, oh. yes. Yeah. That is that person, right? That is right. Sunchokes. Yes, absolutely. That's the correct answer. So well done. Ten points. I was out for dinner last night and um, someone I was with ordered a dish with had sunchokes in it. So where do they grow? Are they, is it a root, the sunchoke that you yeah. eat the edible part? Yeah. So it is, yeah, it's a root and it's a little bit, the plant is a bit like a potato. So you can pull up that whole plant and it will have like half a dozen or more um, of the okay. sunchokes. Okay. Huh. Well. Okay, very good. So shall we go to some questions now? 
Um, let's see. So Nora, Sally's asking, will evergreen huckleberry thrive in a pot? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, I don't see why not. Um, I imagine they like quite acidic soil, but uh, I don't, I don't, I can't see why not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it probably could. They seem, very um, easy, they seem very easy to grow. And my experience is that if they're in the shade, they will definitely grow, but they won't produce much fruit. But if they're in the sun, uh, uh, they produce a lot of fruit. Okay. Okay. Um, Judith is asking, what was the name of the plant with white berries that bees love? Uh, that, well, I call it as a snowball um, bush, but, uh, you know, Laura might know or someone else might know better than me. It's a native plant and um, you'll see it in um, some forested areas. Uh, it was, was already on the property, so I didn't okay. buy it. But uh, it's, uh, it's got, it, the, the photo that I showed, I just took today. So it's got little white um, snowballs on it at this time of year. And in the spring, it's got little tiny, tiny pink uh, flowers. Right, yeah. Well, maybe if someone does know what it's called, they can, they can let us know. Um, question about the mason bee tubes. How do you clean them? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it depends what type of tubes you have. But in general, you um, take the tube apart, you can cut it with an exacto knife. Um, or sometimes you don't even have to have a, a, a hard tube, you can just roll um, um, brown paper and use that as your tube. So you open up the tube and you basically just take out the mason bee cocoons that are in good shape and then you wash them very quickly and uh, dry them and then you put them in your fridge for the rest of the winter and um, in the spring you can put them back outside in the um, mason bee house and they will start hatching in um, the middle of April or sooner if it's um, a, between 10 and 14 degrees they will start hatching so it depends on the temperature, but usually around the middle of April or beginning to middle of April. So, so they sound like they're a bee that's pretty easy to host in a garden, unlike the honeybees. They are, that's right. They're very, very easy to host. Honeybees, really complicated. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear yours didn't yeah. make it. <laughs> that's too bad. I know. Of course, my dad had bees for 40 years. You'd think that I would have learned something, but no. <laughs> <laughs> you will. You'll get there. Um, so, um, question about that front boulevard area, um, it was, do you water it? We do, yeah, you know, because the property is so old that we don't have a watering system, but we just have sprinklers on it. Yeah, we've got a complicated hose system that we set up uh, just in sort of July and August, <laughs> and we just uh, water it with, uh, with good old fashioned sprinklers. Okay. Yeah, especially that first year when you've got all that those new plants. So I was going to ask you the the rock wall that's there. Was that there when you bought the house? The rock wall that's right beside the um, the uh, sidewalk was there, um, but the rocks that were on that sort of second layer, um, we we brought in ourselves. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so so yeah. Layers. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Mm -hmm. um, question about your um fruit trees how do you protect the fig fruits on the tree before they ripen oh yeah that's an excellent question well our fig tree the one we have is still quite young and uh so we only had a couple of figs these year this year and yeah they were both stolen by the squirrels um so i'm thinking about investing in a net this year for both my peach and my fig tree We've got a lot of squirrels because we live right next to Hay Park. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the bear didn't see the figs or the figs were gone. No, the figs were already long gone uh, by that time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, we've had a couple of people tell us now that this snowberry that you were, is the Symphory, Symphory Carpus Alba. Okay. Known as snowberry, waxberry, or ghostberry. Snowberry, yeah. Okay. All genus of about 15 species of deciduous shrubs in the honeysuckle family. Oh, that's oh 
really? Oh, yeah. that one. Capri foliaceae. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Wow. It's all getting quite um, a lot of botany. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Former science teacher, right? That's right. I, yes, yeah. Good. I, I just go, I usually just go by the common names though. I'm, I'm not a good, uh, I'm not a good scientist on my gardening yet. That's yeah. when, that's my retirement. Yeah, well, that's okay. It's a, <laughs> it, that's, that seems to be a whole other study is knowing the proper names. Well, thanks so much. That was wonderful to see the, the, the beautiful plants and it's really thriving. It, it looks very healthy. Your yeah, garden. thank you. Looking great. Um, we are now going to cross the river to North Vancouver to Jackie and Jim's garden. And, um, here's Jackie and Jim. Hi. So um, when they purchased their North Vancouver property 28 years ago, it consisted of grass, gravel, fences, and a few heritage trees and shrubs. Since then, they've transformed it into an award-winning garden noted for its design and unique features. So I think they called their talk Evolution of a Garden. So we're going to hear a little bit about how that 28 years has gone and how they planned it all. So thanks for coming. Great to see you both. Okay, I will bow out and let you guys take over. Um, so as has been mentioned, uh, um, uh, we've lived in this uh, small pie-shaped um, uh, uh, suburban lot here in, in uh, North Vancouver for the last 28 years. And we've been trying to, to you know, develop this garden over all that time. And uh, we've been invited to share with you how things have changed over that 28 years. Now, just to start out, I'd like to say that we didn't start gardening 28 years ago. We've been married for, for 49 years. And we've been gardening at almost every place we've been, whether it was a rental or, a, or an ownership position. But we had a pretty firm idea of what we wanted. So to get us started, let me uh, show you first, uh, the first slide here. So this is the current, uh, what we call the front or the public face of our garden in March of this year. And uh, this is the entrance down into the uh, back garden or private part of our garden uh, again in this year. But things didn't start out anything like this at all. And to give you a sense of that, uh, this was the back garden uh, in 1993 when we actually purchased the house. And uh, what you can see is it's mostly turf and some fence, a few, a few shrubs and, and, uh, and a sort of broken down rockery. Really not very much else. Uh, over this 28 years, this, uh, this back garden from the same view has gone from this position uh, to this position. Now, a lot of this is hardscaping, but a great deal of it is, uh, is plant selection. And all of the things that we've already talked about this evening, like bees and bee pollinators, or sorry, pollinators, uh, having native plants, uh, having a mixture, uh, these are things that we've followed. In fact, we actually keep honeybees on the property as well as lots of native bees. We have many native plants. Now, um, so what we were looking for when we were looking to buy a property 28 years ago was great backyard exposure. Uh, as you can tell from that shot in 1993, in facing west and south, there are no trees to block the sun. So this was key. The other topics we will be um, dealing with today are planning um, to do the renovations we did. Um, the hardscaping we did, and then a virtual tour. So uh, the first thing is exposure. And uh, uh, what most people mean by exposure is the sun, but also wind and altitude are important. And really we're talking about daily patterns of sun and shade, the way that shadows are cast by the house, by nearby trees and buildings, the elevation. We're at 550 feet. That really shaves off effectively one week off each end of the growing season compared to um, uh, down at sea level. And also wind exposure is important. Now everybody shows this kind of slide, but it's really important. We live very far north at about 50 degrees. 
And the point is, is that in the sun, the path of the sun across the sky uh, is very different than in the winter. In the summer, it's very high in the sky at noon, and the day length is about 16 hours. In the winter, you have much more slanted sun, and the day length is only about eight hours. Now, this has a big effect. So take a house with its public garden facing the road frontage, and you have a private garden in the back. Now, if it's facing south at summer solstice at noon, well, there's not going to be any shadow to worry about. But at winter solstice at noon, these being the slanting rays of the sun, um, you can, even a small house can, can actually uh, put quite a bit of area in shade. This is greatly exacerbated if you have a tall, multi-story house. Even if you're facing the other way, you're facing north so that your back garden's getting the sun. If you have a lot of trees, well, again, at summer solstice, that's not a bad thing. You actually probably want this bit of shade in your private garden because it's probably too hot. But the problem is at winter solstice, those trees are gonna cast a huge shadow. And it's going to limit to some extent what you can grow. Not to say shade gardens aren't wonderful, but you can't necessarily grow a vegetable garden there. Well, what we found, well, we set out looking, it took a long time. This is a contemporary Google Earth uh, image. Uh, our house is the green roof, the neighbor's house is in the gray roof. To simplify this though, I'll show you what it looked like. This is the area of road frontage, the house faces 50 degree, 53 degrees east of north. The house and deck and garage and driveway are all here. This was a very steep slope. And the red line represents a long fence that went basically around the perimeter of the actual lot. The, end, the part we ended up actually gardening is much larger than the lot, as you'll see. This is what we started with, though. Basically, all the areas in pale green were lawn, they were turf, and it had been recently put in. The dark green areas were plantings with trees and shrubs and flower beds and that sort of thing. And there were a couple of gravel paths and a driveway, a beautiful deck. This area down in the lower right was actually completely full of just random trash and invasive plants. And we'll talk more about that later. If you take a section of our house, you can see that at summer solstice, all the, all the big trees, the big majestic trees we love on the North Shore, they're all to the north of us. So no problem. Even in winter, they don't cast any reasonable shadow on the area that we plan to do most of our gardening, which is all along here. So this is what we started with. Um, I should emphasize that while we're focused on the sun in the back, we have from deep shade that gets half an hour of um, random sun to uh, 14 hours of full sun. So we've got the full gamut of planning opportunities. But when we started here in the front of the house, you can see there was a gravel pathway and a tiny little bed. And um, in the uh, right hand um, corner, there was uh, a a supporting wall up to the street and another random little, little tiny narrow bed, a gravel driveway and a sloping, steeply sloping um, bed down to the lower garden. Uh, this is another, on the left hand side, another picture of that supporting wall and narrow little bed. And there was a nice little round bed under a very nice huge uh, cypress tree. In the back garden, there's a south side fence, which I should mention now, we very quickly planted on the other side, eight espalier apple trees and two espalier pear trees. So they get absolutely full sun all day. And the right hand picture is the um, 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 west side uh, fence next to the neighbors. 
So we soon quickly made uh, friends with our next door neighbors and Judy and I decided we would attend the landscape gardening course taught at night school at Carson Graham High School by the very famous and renowned landscape gardener, our landscape architect, Elspeth Bradbury. And we naively thought we would be talking about plants, but that was only the last couple of classes. Instead, we spent a great deal of time on learning what we should be thinking about and um, observing in order to um, make a nice landscape garden. The first assignment was to pick a part of the garden we were going to work on, do a scale drawing, and do a panorama picture. So this picture you've already seen, we didn't have a panorama camera, so we, I patched together the panorama of the backyard where I was going to be working on. So here are some of the things that we talked about in that course, just very briefly for those of you who may be considering redesigning some part of your garden. Jim's already talked about exposure, but I'm going to talk about a few of the other things you should be looking at uh, in detail. And the first is your soil conditions. As um, Laura, the first speaker, talked about, um, soil is vital. And when you've got a house like ours, which is 100 years old this year, um, when we, even when we got it, the soil was very poor and depleted and probably compacted. So we were going to do a series of walls and whatnot, and we had to bring in a lot of good quality amended soil. The other thing to consider is your source of water. Because even um, just planting new plants, even though they may not need water eventually or not much, that it's crucial they have quite a bit when they go in. When I did the Master Gardener course, um, one of the things I learned was that if you stand there with a hose and just sprinkle, the water doesn't go very deep and doesn't get to the roots. So you have to figure out how you're gonna supply water to your plants. So you may wanna consider planning and an irrigation system. There's a bunch of things to consider here on this list um, that you might want to build into your plans. And one of them is what's good that you want to keep in your existing garden. We had a number of heritage trees and perennials that we certainly wanted to save. And then things like access, if you're going to do beds or walks, what materials and various other kinds of things you may wish to add, including what we need for privacy. Then there's the uses of your garden. Are you going to have a place for children to play or do you have pets? Absolutely vital, how much time do you want to spend gardening? As you've seen from the previous two presentations, there's never a no maintenance garden. So, um, but as the, I think the Laura's mentioned, there's um, many alternatives to making gardening less work. And certainly you don't double dick. So um, those things can, once you learn about it, you can incorporate some of those uh, less time-consuming uh, jobs. And lastly, of course, you have to study, you consider what your budget is. So after we took this course, we made a number of decisions. First of all, this was going to be a multi-year project. In fact, it turned out that the hardscaping was over 18 years. And um, you can see the other decisions we made, gray brick, river rock and field stone, <clears throat> all paths and walks to be curved, so we've got a consistent hardscape feature throughout. Of course, we are getting an irrigation system. And then the joy of finding plants for the huge variety of um, locations we had. The first thing we started with is putting in a greenhouse. And so this is two pictures of the um, early greenhouse. The picture on the right shows the horrible state of the um, a rock root bed right below it. So this is a picture of the first phase of re-landscaping the lower garden bed. You'll see the pavers, you'll see the curves, and at this point the rock root bed had been rebuilt. 
Here's another picture, but the most important thing about this is our very lovely and wonderful stonemasons, Tony and Angelo Vignoni, who were with us for almost all of our uh, construction. We have a number of heritage perennials we wanted to preserve, and this uh, Japanese maple was one of them. Uh, this is uh, the, the initial re-landscaping of the front beds, and notice the walks and the curved beds. And then a few years later, this is how this was maturing in the front garden. And then in the back garden, we eventually added some more um, beds. And, and I should mention at this point that the what looks like lawn here is alternate ground cover from West Coast seeds, which um, Laura mentioned, you know, is one of the pollinator, early pollinator garden, our, our lawn substitutes. Well, uh, just as we began to get things to working reasonably well, we decided that we needed to renovate the house. So we changed the external appearance of the house. As you can see, this is a, a, almost an immediate before after sort of set. But the house footprint was actually unchanged. So the first thing we had to do was dig up all the plantings that we'd done in the front garden and relocate them so that we could plant them back after the demolition. Now, it wasn't a total demolition, but it did sort of gut the center of the house and they had to dig this enormous trench at the front of the house to put in a new water line. So it was kind of a demolition, but again, we didn't change the footprint and the hundred year old house's bones are still there. By spring of 2000 though, we had that finished and we put the garden back in as best we could, although you know, it, it, it suffered a bit from its relocation. Uh, there were areas of the garden, this we call the side garden, and I'd just like to point out, this was an area, this was an early attempt at, that we did of, of landscaping, and I didn't think it worked out well. It's part of the old fence. The thing I'd like to say is everything to the right of this fence was just derelict, a completely derelict, abandoned property, basically. Uh, this is entirely different today, but anyway, an early attempt. We added a, a water feature. This is uh, uh, actually a, a shaped concrete by a company that's out of business now called Liquid Stone. It's made to look like slate. There's not a pool here because we didn't want to draw in uh, raccoons and, and great blue herons to be eating koi and things like that. It's just, it just doesn't seem like a good idea. Friends that have ponds uh, usually regret it. Um, this is another view of, of part of that uh, water feature area and as, as this uh, garden is starting to mature. Um, the last major project of 2009 to 11 was on the east side of the house and quite a bit of this is really on city land. Now again, let me just orient you. This is looking straight down. This is our house or a little corner of the house, the driveway, the dead end street, the road frontage. And outlined in blue is the area we're talking about. Now these star-shaped uh, um, symbols were black locust trees, a very bad invasive species. Uh, these were horse chestnut trees, again, an invasive species. This was an abandoned um, uh, basketball hoop. And even the most important thing is inside the red zone here was completely overgrown in a very mature stand of Japanese knotweed and, uh, and bamboo. They, to give you an idea of just how severe this infestation was, we had to bring in a full-size excavator. He worked for two days to dig out the bamboo and the uh, knotweed. When we ended up, this was just after we finished, that's that same area now outlined in black, we put in a new thing. This actually has four sets of stairs in it because it's quite a steep slope. This is a public walkway and people use it uh, by the dozens every day. Uh, these are walls to support the terraces and these are the terraces closer to the house. So at this point, we've kind of finished the hardscaping. So I wanna bring you back. This is what we started with, uh, the house. Remember the dark green are the garden plantings and the uh, light green are the lawn or turf, and this area was just full of trash 
and invasive species. And the red was the original fence. Well, this is where we are today. The red is still the original fence. It's only fallen down because it hasn't fallen down because the espalier trees hold it up. Uh, otherwise, it would have rotted way long ago, but it looks good, actually. All of these uh, gray are, are paths. You can see they're curving. And you can now see that the areas that are turf, and remember, they're not turf. They're actually uh, this easy care lawn. I, I mow four to five times a year. Uh, and the rest of it is all in gardens uh, of various kinds. Uh, but we have lots of vegetables as well as all the other things. So now we're going to take you on a virtual tour. Now, the, this is just going to be a lot of photographs. I'm not going to talk during the photographs, or maybe not at all. Might add a word or two here and there. I'll only leave them up for about three or four seconds. So they'll be quick. And, you know, uh, it's just to give you a taste of what's happened. These are all seasons, all times. I'd also like to say that I picked these pictures to be flattering of the garden. It doesn't always look perfect, I've got to admit. So this is front of house. This is winter. Fine. Careful. Um, finally, we're just ending with a couple of uh, three fun shots. The first is since Halloween's coming up, 
there's our witches that will join in our front porch. And then a couple of sunset shots. This is that sort of wide angle view from the top, uh, top deck in our house. And uh, this is what it looks like when you have a, a big telephoto lens. So thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Wow. Wow. That was so beautiful. Such a tonic. Just to you know, look at those beautiful pictures. Oh, lovely. Well, are you going to do it again? Or <laughs> I got another property in mind? <laughs> because it's, it's or, or, I mean, it looks to me like it's done. Like you've done everything. A garden, you've done. A garden is never done. We spend a lot of time settling border disputes when plants decide they're going to outcompete somebody else. And uh, we're, I think I replanted three or four different beds this year. It's wow. never done. Never done. Yeah. I've also, uh, I would also add that um, when we started out, we didn't do a lot of vegetable gardening here, although we've done it in the past. Yeah. And it, over the last six or seven years, we've just gotten deeper and deeper into vegetables. And now it's become one of the things I spend my most time doing. Oh. And we use the greenhouse to start a huge number of uh, vegetables. And, um, and we, we also grow many vegetables in what are called earth boxes on our big deck, which is just an ideal place to grow tomatoes and, and cucumbers and things like that. I mean, just the output is just phenomenal. From, oh, from, that's great. From well, you have a lot of sun, right? You have yeah, on the property. Well, yeah. we've, we've got, as I said, from deep shade to, you know, where there might be some filtered light all the way through to 14 hours of sun. So we grow a lot of herbs. We've got a lot of lavenders and all sorts of herbs yeah. and berry bushes and stuff. So, yeah. you know, we just indulge ourselves. Yeah, what, whatever. And, um, yeah, no, it, it's... The other thing is uh, compost. Um, I've got two conventional, I've built a myself type compost, but we take about two and a half cubic meters of compost out of the compost piles every year. And that goes in and, and, uh, and, and we, re we recycle several metric tons of material from the garden uh, through that. Uh, I know because some of it I have to take to the, to the uh, green waste and they weigh it for me and, and I know what I'm doing, right? And so we're talking huge amounts because so this is not an easy garden to look after. And let me tell you, it's a, it's a bit of work. Yeah, anyway. no, I know. Well, I was, I was wondering about that because Judith mentioned in this sort of advice is to think about the maintenance, think about how much, how much time can you actually devote to your garden? And it looks like you both are putting in a lot of time to that garden. Well, I, let me just say that for almost all of this time, we were both working full time and raising a family as well. Because when we moved into this house, our kids were still pretty small. And we didn't give them any consideration about the design of the garden. That, <laughs> and, <laughs> that was their hard luck. And now they're both gardeners. <coughs> oh, they're gardeners. Yeah, oh so wow, nice. wow. Well, um, I, I do have a question in um, the Q&A for you guys. Um, actually, most of the comments have just been commending you and your beautiful garden, fabulous. I think people are a bit um, sort of awestruck and not sure what to say, but one person, Amber is asking, she says, I have quite a shady back yard. What would you suggest me to plant? So um, <laughs> where do you start the master with that? Gardener answered this question. Well, if you look at just our, our entire front garden is pretty much shade. And if you looked at those pictures of shade, I mean, you can have so many successful and lovely things in a shade garden. And um, in our deep shade, we've got some heritage of maples and rhododendrons, and they're under, under planted with a sea of oxalis. Just simple oxalis, and it's absolutely stunning. Yeah. So, um, you know, in front of our house, that is shade. That's north, and it's shaded completely. It gets a little bit, about an hour of east sun on a slant in the morning. Right. And, you know, oh. there's so much you can do, but you can't do veggies and you can't do herbs. Right, right, right. Maybe we'll ask Nora and Laura to come on the video now and, and they oh, can yes. suggest um, some nice shade plants. I know that, in Laura, in your garden, you had some beautiful mosses and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, I mean, that's something that does well in shade, obviously, and ferns and... 
I, th I think it depends on the orientation. If you can go up in the shade, that beautiful native honeysuckle is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. and you'll get, you'll get um, hummingbirds and bees going in and uh, it just grows so fast. It's, it's lovely and ferns, you know, I, I love ferns. I think I might've been a fern in a former life. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite shade plant, Nora? Well, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of hostas. Mm -hmm. My hostas grow a lot in the shade and they just take up so much space and stop the weeds. So, um, mm -hmm. and I love moss too. Whenever I can, you know, encourage it to grow, I love the moss. Yeah, yeah. No, hostas, I, 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 they're great. They're just, um, they're seasonal, right? Because they're gone, gone yeah. through the winter. Yeah. And of course, it depends if it's dry shade or, or if it's moist or it's wet, right? That makes a difference. Well, gosh, um, there aren't any more questions um, unless you wanted to ask one another something. If mm, you just one had point. a question for each other. Mm. I, I think there may be some confusion about winterberry. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're believe, back to that. Yeah, okay. I, I believe. Did you um, see the chat? Did, could you see it? Um, I, I didn't look, but the, the point is, is I think the, the local plant that's called winterberry, and there are many plants called winterberry, mm -hmm. uh, is actually toxic, and you don't want to eat it. Oh, and, no, uh, I, I wonder think if you're thinking look that up carefully because, uh, it, you know, it, it, it actually, um, you know, spearmint, it does taste like spearmint. That's not a good thing. Um, you know, mints are actually there to repel insects, and they're, they're, they're often toxic alkaloids. So, you know, you, you, I think, you know, your audience should, should know that they, they want to be very careful about that sort of thing, um, if I'm missing. So are you talking about that winter green? The winter, winter green? green, yeah, winter yeah. green. Winter green. So are you, I, are you saying it's toxic? Well, some winter berries, some plants that go by a similar name are. Oh, okay. Well, winter green is the one, the one that I've got. Let me, let me, let me recheck for you and I'll, I, I don't want to make this. You know what, Nora, that, that looked like uh, Kinnikinick to me or no, Berry. No, it wasn't it. Eh? No. no, I've got Kinnikinick. It's definitely hmm. winter green. Well, that's what the tags all said when I bought it. Wow. <laughs> well, the thing about common names is they can be, um, yeah, Applied to a number of different plants. No, okay. it 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 it, it, sh it yeah. should be okay. Don't well, not she ate it and she's it. still here. So <laughs> sorry, yeah, don't don't confuse it with winter berry. That's all. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Good okay. Stuff. All right. Um, did it? Did you have any other questions for each other? Anything? No. Boy. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. I, mean, I know that putting those presentations was a lot of work and they were just all so excellent. Uh, the photos and all of your stories. Of course, not as much work as the gardens themselves, but um, <laughs> so tremendous. And really, I hope that it was a, a benefit to you as, as much as to all of us, because I, I really enjoyed it. And I know that uh, all of our people who came tonight did as well. Um, so um, thank you again and um, for sharing those really special places and um, this is lovely. And next week we have um, someone coming to talk about seed saving. Um, oh, Carolyn Harriet from uh, Vancouver Island. She used to run um, Seeds of Victoria um, for 25 years, but now she lives in Ladysmith. Still saving seeds, but um, not running that business anymore. So that'll be next Thursday, the 15th. And if anyone wants to um, come to it, just register on the website, or you can send me an email and I'll make sure you get a Zoom link. And that's it. So thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, maybe there'll be some pumpkin pie if someone has sugar pumpkin from their garden. <laughs> Good. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.